I'll be safe, I promise. Here we go. Okay, we are beginning. Okay, everybody, welcome to History Matters and definitely Soda's Coffee. Um, today we're going to be talking about, um, is the Republican Party dying? That's <laughs> Okay, um, Claire has become Sam the Avocado. Um, I just made up a, a character named Sam the Avocado and, and now it exists. Um, at any rate, uh, we're going to be talking about the Republican Party. Uh, and is it dying? And what does it mean if it's dying? And how other parties um, have or haven't died in the past and what that might tell us about today's Republican Party. But before I do that, I turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who is in a mysterious location, uh, who will explain to us the rules of the game before we begin. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I am at the historic Way and Oak Hotel in Farmville, Virginia about a mile and a half from the historic Moton School, which was uh, where a student walkout occurred that later led to the Brown versus Board decision. And you can look that up. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, we're here every Friday. We love when we have new folks join us. We've already had a few of you introduce yourselves in the chat. My role here is to monitor the chat and the Q&A. Joanne's gonna talk about today's topic for about 30 minutes. Please add any questions you have about today's topic in the Q&A, and then I'll be back in about 30 minutes and we'll discuss it. I'll see y'all soon. Okay. So um, as Annie just suggested, if you are here for the first time, this is our, I believe, 205th episode of History Matters and So Does Coffee. If you are here for the first time, please tell folks uh, in chat, make sure that you're talking to everyone um, and you will get a robust welcome from the History Matters community, which truly is a community. Um, and today, as I mentioned a moment ago, what we're going to be talking about is parties that have died and what that can tell us about the current state of affairs with the Republican Party. I, I say this many, many times. I don't know how many times I've said it over those 204 previous episodes that my, my American citizen brain uh, is sort of on one track going, what the heck? And my historian brain is going, oh, <laughs> this is interesting. So I'm kind of in that place today. I'm, I'm, I'm putting on my political historian hat here to, to talk to you, but it's because I think it says some interesting things that, that looking at political history says some interesting things about what we're seeing today in the Republican Party. Um, and I want to start with a basic fact, uh, and that is, you know, I, I, we take a lot of things for granted. I've said a few bazillion times that we have long taken democracy for granted and we shouldn't and can't. But another thing that we take for granted is that we have a two-party system and that that two-party system consists of Democrats and Republicans. So we have the Democratic Party, we have the Republican Party, and that's American politics. And part of what I'm going to be talking about today is that that has been true for a while. That has definitely not always been true. There has not necessarily been a long-standing assumption that we would have two national parties there have not been the same two parties in place for long stretches until this sort of last bout. But even so, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the state of affairs where American politics centers on Democratic Party and Republican Party has been a state of affairs, but might not be the permanent state of affairs. And so there's more, just as I say very often that democracy is a process, not an end point. I think our political system generally has more flux in it than we might recognize. And that's a little bit of what I want to address today. As a starting point, um, I want to offer, I'm actually not going to post it because I'm afraid of doing things that will like somehow or other blow up <laughs> the recording of what I'm saying, but I will read it out instead. Um, there's a there's a website uh, that, um, well, I'll give you the, the address I want you to go to. It's called BioGuide, and it's a biographical guide to members of Congress. But the place I want you to go is bioguideretro.congress.gov. So it's an official guide, and I'll I'll say that again. Bio, it's HTTPS uh, colon slash slash bioguideretro.congress.gov. Um, and what I want you to do if you go to that page, um, you'll see that you'll have the option to select a party. And if you just open and scroll through the options for party, I, I do not have chat open, so I cannot see if this is happening or or not. So I will trust you 
uh, regular community members to, to guide this process. But if you open and just scroll through the options of which parties you can pick, you will see a countless number of parties. This is, I woke up this morning thinking, what can I use to illustrate the simple fact that we've had a lot of political parties in American history? They've come, they've gone. Some have lasted a very short amount of time. Some have lasted longer. Um, but just to give you a sense of that, you can't do better than scrolling through the many, 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 many political parties that are reflected in just who has been a member of Congress over the years. So parties have come, parties have left. I want to look at two particular parties that have come and gone, and I want to look at why they have come and gone and then come back to the present moment. Okay, so... I see a little thumb floating up, which suggests to me that somebody has precisely found what I wanted them to find. Thank you for registering that because I'm I'm floating in space, staring at notes and my face. Okay, so um, I want to start, not surprisingly, with the Federalist Party. Um, that is definitely a a party that was here and then left. Uh, on a, on the national scene, it lasted you know, a little over a decade. It didn't die when Thomas Jefferson became president on a national level, but it was fading away. It lasted um, for a little while in the beginning of the 19th century on a state level, less on a national level. And the the um, stronghold of federalism ended up being Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute when I explain what happened to the Republican Party. So, the, the, I'm sorry, the Federalist Party. So the Federalist Party, generally speaking, and I'm not going to go into um, great detail about what they stood for, the very easy way to sum that all up is that the Federalists in the first 10, 15 years of government really wanted a stronger national government. Hamilton is you know, at the head of that party in a sense, although again, different conversation. I don't consider the Federalist Party a real party because it suggests a lot of modern trappings that weren't there at the time, but regardless, Hamilton was, a leading Federalist for much of this period, strong national government, that's what they stood for. What they were uncomfortable with, and this became increasingly a problem, was the democratic component of the new democratic republic. They just were uneasy with how much power the public in a government grounded on public opinion, how much power the public could have and how they would wield that power. The Republican, Jeffersonian Republican Party, not the current Republican Party, but the Jeffersonian Republican Party, they, on one hand, they were the opposition party, so they had to be more focused on the popular will and the, the, the public and the more democratic component, but they also sincerely were friendlier to that component of this new developing nation in its first 10 years. You can say in some ways that in the first 10 years of our government, democracy and the the extent to which it would be in place was a major issue that was being discussed. How democratic, small d, was this new government going to be? And the Federalists said, let's, you know, let's move it down to the less end of the spectrum and the Republicans, Jeffersonian Republicans, liked it more. The Alien and the Sedition Acts, of the late 1790s um, made this some aspects of what the Federalists were doing more obvious. Um, the, Feder the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed in a time of quasi-war. It was almost a war, but not quite, with France. Um, on the one hand, the Federalists said, well, we need to deal with national security at a time of quasi-war. On the other hand, they said we can really effectively use these acts to shut up some of our opposition. That didn't look so good. Uh, and what you end up seeing, and I'm, I'm like somewhere up in, you know, uh, founder heaven or founder purgatory or wherever you would like founders to be, um, they're, they're spinning because I'm whizzing through this decade and I'm making this a very quick story, but I need to. Um, essentially, you get the election of 1800, you get the Jefferson becoming president, you get the rise uh, of the Jeffersonian Republicans, you get a definite decision towards leaning towards more democratic rather than less democratic. But the story of the death of the Federalist Party is in part, they left 
well, I don't even want to say they left the public behind. I was just about to say they left the public behind. They were never really lined up with the public. They really weren't super concerned, except to the degree that they felt they needed to be in a republic, a democratic republic. They weren't courting the public. They didn't want to court the public. They didn't think it was proper to court the republic. There's a Hamilton letter uh, after the election of 1800 uh, in which he's trying to figure out what happened wrong. And one of the things he decides is that the um, Jeffersonian Republicans were courting the public by appealing to their, and he writes this in all capital letters, vanity. The Republicans were just like appealing to the vanity of the public, right? And look, it won them power. We need to figure out how to do the same thing. That's not a party that's um, grappling with the fact that this is a form of government in which the public actually sincerely needs to be dealt with. So the Federalist Party, partly sinks because they are not in step with the American public. They simply are not. And they cannot survive that way, although they kind of assumed that perhaps they could, they couldn't. The reason why they survive for a while on a state level and particularly in Connecticut is because in Connecticut, they had popular support. Connecticut was always this, you know, state of no change, stalwart federalists. So where they had popular support, on a local level, on a state level, they survived. But so the, the moral of that story, the moral of the Federalist story is, why did that party die? Because they didn't really have popular support. They really didn't have widespread um, support from the American public, regardless of whether they thought they did, regardless of whether they thought that what they were doing was for the good of the public, which they would have told you that's what they thought. Federalist party. Now I want to beam us forward in time to the Whig Party, <coughs> excuse me, um, which formed in roughly 1834, dies in roughly 1854, does not have a very long life. Um, but let's look at the Whig Party and what it was, and more importantly, considering today's conversation, why it died. Okay, so the Whig Party forms in opposition to Andrew Jackson. So it's it's not a party that essentially people come together and say, we are all for a strong tariff. They get there, but they start out really, it's a collection of all kinds of people who are united by the fact that they do not like King Andrew, Andrew Jackson, who seems to be wanting in one way or another to be you know a kind of king-like president. So it's a blend of people, a blend of interests. They become a party that stands for big business, that stands for national strength, that stands for national improvements. Um, and some famous Whigs include people like Henry Clay and, and Daniel Webster, and at first, Abraham Lincoln. Now, the Whig Party's churning along, doing its thing, representing big business against Jackson, anti-bank Jackson, right? Jackson, the supposed man of the white people. Um, what happens to the Whig Party? Well, Slavery happens to the Whig Party. What we see, so they begin in 1834, by 1854, and that's when you get the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which is determining how future states can decide whether they will be uh, allow slavery within their borders. Slavery becomes the issue at the center of national politics. The Whigs, for a while, just tried to avoid that issue because you couldn't you couldn't get around that issue. You couldn't wrestle with that issue. That issue was going to divide the party. So they tried not to deal with it in some ways. Eventually, by the 1850s, they can't. They can't avoid it anymore. So what happens? Well, the Whig Party divides. The Whig Party splits over a moral issue. And for some, a, a pragmatic issue. So for some, the question of slavery is immoral issue. This is improper. It's immoral. I am against it. We should be against it. And if the party is not against it, I cannot belong to this party. For some, they're more thinking about practicalities. They're thinking about things like free labor in the West. They're not necessarily thinking of morality, but they're still um, not necessarily comfortable with slavery. But in one way or another, um, Slavery becomes the sort of um, iceberg dead ahead destruction of the Whig Party. They cannot get around it. They collide with it. And the Whig Party divides. 
Um, some members of the Whig Party, northern members of the Whig Party, anti-slavery members of the Whig Party become Republicans. Some members of the Whig Party become know-nothings or members of the American Party, nativist. That's what they center around. Immigration, nativism, you know, the American Party, they mean that in a very literal way. So the party divides anti-slavery versus nativism. And, you know, it, it, it's gone. It, it vanishes and divides and other parties come and go. Again, a reminder of how our political system is more in flux or certainly has been in the past than we've necessarily witnessed in the modern era. Okay, so now this, this brings us back to the present day. We've looked at a party, the Federalists, who died in part because they did not have a lot of public support behind them. They did not care about more than they felt that they had to to succeed, appealing to the public in the way that the Jeffersonian Republicans did. So they didn't have the public behind them in a way that could keep them in power. We have the Whig Party that banged up against the iceberg dead ahead issue of slavery. Now we have the Republican Party. Now, interestingly, today's Republican Party and I think we've been seeing this more and more recently. And as I always say, contingency, we really, really, really don't know what's coming. But part of what we're seeing, and particularly in the recent past, is a Republican Party that appears to be leaving behind big chunks of public opinion, right? Now, we already know that they do not necessarily reflect the majority when it comes to abortion. Now, in vitro fertilization, Suddenly, that, that's in jeopardy. That does not have massive popular support behind it. Their views on LGBTQ issues, their views on racial minorities, um, their views on potentially birth control. There are any number of ways in which today's Republican Party is becoming more strident and more blatant and more extreme in ways that really do not necessarily reflect public opinion. So again, if you think about the Federalists and you think about the fact that they do their thing and they, in a sense, become more extreme as they feel jeopardized uh, and as they think they can really make it big because there's a quasi war with France, today's Republicans right now appear to be adrift a little bit when it comes to public opinion. I don't know what this means or how it will develop, but I think you can say that the public is now watching and wondering to a degree that they might not have before. And I think the Supreme Court's actions this week in deciding to take on the question of former President Trump's immunity, seeming immunity, um, again, we're at a moment where I think more people, again, we can discuss this in the Q&A period, but I think more people are pausing for a moment to consider the nature of what's happening, the direction of what's happening. The, they, they can ask, what's being hijacked here? Is something being hijacked here? Is something being forced on us here? And those are serious questions. And those are questions that may or may not, but I think very possibly could, continue to affect and perhaps increasingly affect the popularity, meaning broad public appeal in any way, whatever possible broad public appeal it, happens, it has, of the Republican Party. So that's popularity, that's the Federalists. Now let's go to the Whig Party that crashes in part against a moral issue and a practical issue, the iceberg dead ahead, I just like that, I wrote it all over my notes, issue of slavery. Donald Trump is the iceberg dead ahead of today's Republican Party. He, for many, is a moral issue, right? You can't get around the fact that for many people, for logical reasons, uh, he is immoral. There are moral problems with supporting him. Let's put it that way. P people feel morally compromised in supporting him in one way or another. It's also a practical problem to deal with him because now you have a party that appears to be centered on one person, not as a candidate, but as the source of all. And part of my, my political historian hmm, head um, has been looking at the simple hijacking of the Republican Party by Donald Trump, right? And we're watching it step by step. We're seeing the RNC conceivably be taken over by Laura Trump, who has openly said she supports using the funds of the RNC for Donald Trump. Mitch McConnell stepping down, along with a good number of other 
um, Republicans in Congress who have decided not to run again for office. And these many of them represent what one might consider to be moderate, certainly not MAGA congressmen stepping aside. Again, another reflection of the fact that a certain kind of Republican is just stepping off stage. So um, morality, practicality, you support Trump or you don't. And if you don't, you seemingly cannot be a member of today's Republican Party. What we're seeing with the Republican Party today, in a sense, is a combination of what I just talked about with the Federalists and the Whigs. They appear to be really not focused on the public and public opinion in a way that really truly reflects it. And they're just becoming more and more extreme as they go. And the more they do, I think the more people will notice and question what that means. I, again, I don't know what the outcome of that is because there's a whole another question here of um, structures and free and fair elections and any number of other things that could shape where we're going. But I do think at this moment, the Republican Party is, and they, I think they increasingly are aware of the fact that they do not reflect the majority of what the American public wants on some of these issues that I just named. And the simple problem of Donald Trump, while he brings people, some people together, and they support him with cult-like adoration, uh, and the party now, in a sense, is, one could argue, not the Republican Party, but the Trump Party. Um, and is that a party? That's an interesting question that one could also ask. What do parties do? I started to research this earlier, thinking I could weave that into the conversation, but it's so broad um, that we can address it in Q&A, but I wasn't able to address it to the point that I wanted to weave it in as a major part of what I'm talking about this morning. But what we have is the Republican Party becoming whatever, the party of Trump. I don't. I hesitate to say cult because I think that has so much baggage with it that it almost erases conversation. So whatever we call it, we call it a Trump cult, but um, and maybe it isn't a party. Regardless, um, you have the, the moral and practical issue of Donald Trump. You have the very um, front and center, pure small D democratic issue of does the public support them? And that's kind of where that party is right now. Now, what will happen with that? We don't know. But the question that I asked at the outset and the question that I posted on social media, is the Republican Party dying? If you think about how other parties in American history have died, popularity and morality are two big ones. Popularity, morality, and pragmatics. Those are big ones. And as we're watching a certain kind of Republican simply step away and essentially say, I'm not part of this now. This does not reflect me. That's significant. And that's some of what we've been seeing. And that's that, in a way, Mitch McConnell deciding to step down as leader um, is highly symbolic of that. Uh, just like the Supreme Court decision to hear um, the question of presidential immunity it, it is highly symbolic of the question of, you know, it, are things being hijacked? Uh, are Republicans hijacking things in a way that feels illicit, that feels improper? Um, so anyway, my, my larger point here is that parties that have died in American history, it's not the only things that have killed them. But it makes perfect sense that democratic popularity and morality are two big things that can kill a party. They can also drive a party to extremes. They can also do, there are any number of other things um, that one can conclude based on this. But it's really worth noticing when we consider what the Republican Party is doing and is it or will it self-destruct? I don't know, but it might. Now, in saying that, I think it's important to say, and anyone who has regularly come to these conversations knows that this is not what I'm saying. I am not saying, oh, they're on their way out. It's all going to be okay because the party is dying. That is definitely not what I'm saying. Um, I am simply saying that the structure of politics as we now know it, or as we have long known it, kind of no longer exists right now. We're in a different space. What that means, I don't know, but I'm not saying they're dying so all is going to be okay because they're going away. I'm saying that this is another way in which our politics is in flux. In the end, it might be a good thing. It might be that the question of morality and the question of popularity might do in the extremist 
wing of the Republican Party, which is now the Republican Party, and will become increasingly so as the sort of more lawmaking focused, more moderate members of the party appear to be stepping out of the way. It might be that this signals the end of the party, but it doesn't absolutely do so. And so I'm not telling you to um, put a big smile on your face and calm down because it's all going to be okay. It certainly means that we need to watch what's happening with that party and consider those two big factors, popularity, morality, and how the party itself is juggling that and how they may or may not be having an impact on the power and survival of the Republican Party itself. Again, we have a party too, and I've talked about this before, that is not absolutely wedded to democratic norms, forms, conventions, structures. Um, that's my, my always overly diplomatic way. They are not wedded to these democratic conventions, norms, structures. Um, they're not. And so in a way, by being the, that kind of party, there are some um, ways in which we really don't know what direction things are going to go. Um, that said, the degree to which things are in flux, the degree to which the Republican Party kind of doesn't exist anymore in the way that we thought it, it did, and that whatever it is now, we are watching this happen. We're watching whatever it's going to be. Now, it's it's interesting because as I was writing up my notes, um, I thought about the fact that the Whig Party formed around the simple fact that all of the people who joined it initially just hated the monarchical cultish figure of Andrew Jackson. That that was what created the Whig Party. Kind of interesting to consider, right? Are we, is, is, what, what Might there be another party of the right that forms and coheres and isn't just anti-Trumpers, but becomes something else? Liz Cheney um, said something along these lines, and um, I'm going to quote her, and maybe then I'll stop and we can open things up for questions. Liz Cheney said, the Republican Party clearly got, is, I'm sorry, so caught up in this cult of personality that it's very hard to imagine that the party can survive. I think increasingly it's clear that once we get through 2024, we're going to have to have something else, something new. I believe the country has to have a party that's based on conservative principles and values where we can engage with the Democrats on substance and on policy. Um, I think having more than one party is important. I think having a party that's based on conservative principles that can engage with the Democrats on substance and policy is important. Might that conservative party form initially on the simple fact of opposition to the iceberg dead ahead of Donald Trump? I don't know, but I think it's really interesting to consider. Okay, I will stop. Um, now I will, I will I, okay, mug, mug, mug. Um, I, I cover up, uh, I know I say this every week, I cover up the, the, the notes, you know, the chat so that I can't see it because I'll get so involved, I know I'll talk with you guys. Um, but now it's off and I can see mug, mug, mug. Okay. This one, I think my lipstick off there. So for those of you who are here and haven't been here before, um, every week for 205 weeks, I have had a mug that reflects what we're talking about. Um, I do not have 205 mugs, um, but I've been creative in their use. Uh, and this one I think is going to be kind of obvious. I think we'll see. I'll vote it up. One last time. <laughs> There's a signature on that one? Uh, Lynn manuel Miranda. It's from the... Oh, oh, oh. One last time. And then on the back it says, I took my shot. <laughs> That's so, a nice big mug too. It is. So I, I thought that... That's right. Teaching them how to say goodbye. Um, I love this mug, but I think it, it was more on target today than it might ever have been before. I'm sure I must have used it at least once before. But um, at any rate, let me open things up so I can see what yeah. you guys are saying. Uh, oh my gosh, it's been flying by. I'm sure, I'm funny. sure. Okay, yeah. open up the chat. Okay. Here All right, are you ready for questions? I'm ready. Okay. Uh, Lori Dowd asks, 
Do you think the MAGA folks reference the founders to use the less democratic federalist ideals as a gateway to their authoritarianism? Wait, repeat the question for me. Do I think? Do you think the MAGA folks reference the founders to use the less democratic federalist ideas as a gateway to authoritarianism? Oh, I, I mean, offhand, I would say I wouldn't even go that deep. I think I think quoting the founders means you're saying I'm as American as I can possibly be and the founders are demigods and America is the founders. And I always say to my students, if you can get a founder on your side, if you can quote a founder and make it sound like the founder agrees with you, which is what most politicians do, they're not using founder quotes in context at all. They're just warping them to mean whatever they want them to mean. If you can do that, then you're you're you know, claiming that you're as American as it can be and you have all the credentials and the, you know, all that America means is behind you. I think that's the main reason. And and I don't think this is a, you know, amazingly new idea, but I think that's the main reason why people pull at the founders. I think they're actually not thinking about what the founders actually said. And as a matter of fact, um, I, I've just been, uh, I was on Twitter this week, I made the grave mistake of correcting someone who said that the constitution says you can overturn a government when it becomes tyrannical. Um, and I said, no, that's actually not the constitution. And then suddenly all the mansplainers appeared all mm -hmm. telling me, you know, what the constitution means and kind of forgetting about the declaration of independence, but regardless, um, you know, and all sort of coming forward in this, that our government is about being against government. <laughs> our government is about, overthrowing government and the idea that um, the constitution or or democracy works in the way that some on the right want it to work is a problem. That's what I've been experiencing and trying to bat away on um, the platform formerly known as Twitter. But regardless, um, the founders are a convenient stand-in uh, for many people to be whatever you want them to be. Uh, and I think that's how they're, they're being used as a kind of shield of America um, based on what people want them to be. And, you know, um, the the essence of America is what some on the right want them to be. And the essence of America means what they want it to be. You can, you can, um, you can dig, you know, you can go an, another place to go, Founders Online. You can go to Founders Online. It has the papers of a lot of you know, uh, major league founders, Franklin, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, Washington. And you can search for phrases or words and you will find some that say what you want them to say, regardless of whether you're using them or quoting them truthfully. It's really easy to do. And it's obviously it's what politicians do all the time. Uh, our good friend Francesca from across the pond who is recovering. I hope your ankle feels better, Francesca. Um, she wanted to know if you could comment on how the American wigs related, if any, to the British wigs. Mm -hmm. So the idea, the name was, you know, the, the original earlier British wigs were in, in a sense, anti-monarchical. They were, they were critiquing the king. So the Whig party, when it formed King Andrew, there, if, if you could um, go and Google King Andrew, ja King Andrew Jackson, there's a very famous cartoon of Andrew Jackson sitting on a throne in robes, holding a scepter. That that was in part where, precisely where that came from. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, our good buddy Dave. Dave has a couple of questions. I'm going to take them one at a time here. Given the Electoral College and the reliance the current Republican Party has come to depend on it to win the presidency, how does the current Republican Party actually die, especially if the election of the president is thrown to the House of Representatives? Repeat that one again for me. Um, he's talking about how the Electoral College is what the Republican Party has relied on in the last few election cycles. So how does the current Republican Party die if the election ends up being decided by the House? Well, when it gets thrown to the House, it's one state, one vote. It's not decided by numbers. Um, it still might be a problem, but it's not if the if the assumption is they have the majority and so they naturally win majority of numbers. Um, it would be one state, one vote. That still might have the same outcome, but that's something to consider. But the larger question as to how does the Republican Party die 
it doesn't necessarily die losing a presidential election. I mean, I don't know how, how or even ultimately if it will die, but there are many ways for a party to die. And sometimes it's a presidential election. Sometimes it's locally. Sometimes it's losing local elections, losing local power. Um, it might be something entirely new. I have no idea. Um, but it won't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the electoral college and a, and a presidential election that brings it down. All right. Um, all right. Our good buddy Rich Houston says, was the Southern strategy of the GOP developed 50 years ago premised on the nature of the Senate and Electoral College? The path to power doesn't rely on gaining a popular majority. Appealing to the base is the key power. Well, I think the appealing to the base uh, as, as the key to power is important. And yes, that is um, in part what you know, the Republican Party has been doing to an extreme degree. I mean, in a sense, any party needs to appeal to some kind of a base, but but wooing this sort of solid base and, and keeping hold on it and not thinking about what's outside that solid base, you know, we've seen that to an extreme degree recently. Um, I can't talk about the Southern strategy only because that is not in my wheelhouse, so I don't have a lot of knowledge about the, the 20th century dynamics of how that Southern strategy worked. Thank you for acknowledging that it exists. Um, that's another thing that on social media people like to howl about. Um, so I don't know the the formal answer to that question, but, but it is a good question, and it does link directly to what I just said about um, popularity and public support. Um, what does it mean when you're courting the base if the base is a small, highly loyal, but small group, what do you do? And can you function that way? Can you ultimately win that way? Um, I, probably the answer is sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. The question is what happens now? Because that base increasingly is extreme in what they are supporting. All right. Um, Deb, Pomerantz, who I know is with us very often, but this time it says Deb and Paul Goldman. So I don't know if she brought a friend or she's borrowing somebody's iPad. <laughs> but if you brought a friend, we love it when you bring new friends to our community, Deb. Uh, <laughs> their question is, what changes to our political system would have to happen in order to make it feasible for more than two parties to successfully participate in U.S. national politics? I like that question. It's a good question and it's a hard question. Like why why always two parties, right? Because other countries have more than two parties, right? There are other countries that have had more than two parties. And, and, and we have had moments as that scroll through list of the names of parties suggests when we've had more than two. Um, but generally speaking, we've been a two party country. We might be coming to a moment when for a little while we're gonna be a three party country if the Republicans mm -hmm. become whatever they are and there becomes something else, which is an actual conservative party as opposed to MAGA. I don't know. Um, it's a good question. And I, I actually, I remember being in grad school um, and asking. So when I was in grad school um, and we had to take a, like a survey course for, during our first year, the first half of American history, the second half. And I had less than no background in the second half, anything modern. I had been sitting reading primary sources about early America. So suddenly there I am, and I'm asking all these questions in the modern half of the course. And they were questions that kind of didn't really have an answer. So like, I remember asking, well, what is the state? <laughs> like, how do you, what is, like define the state, right? And I remember I it launched this big discussion. And I also asked, why only two parties? Like, why have we always generally centered on two parties. And these are questions that did not have easy answers, right? I, what I remember is that the, the people teaching the class were like, oh boy, <laughs> questions. Um, I don't have an easy answer uh, for why we have only had two parties. I mean, it is worth saying that at the beginning, nobody wanted any parties, right? That we started out uh, with that generation of people thinking that political parties um, were a sign that things had gone wrong. And then over the course of the 1790s, as the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans appear to be acting more and more and more party-like, uh, people took that as a sign that it was all going down, things were horrible, everything was going to explode. Um, so, you know, that's a very early assumption that somehow or other you can have peoples and factions bumping up against each other and it won't cohere into parties. 
Um, but it's worth noting that even from the beginning, you know, not only not assuming two, but not assuming any. Um, mm. I see, I'm trying to catch up here. I know. Um, well, no, hang on a sec. I do want to respond. They didn't want parties, but then they signed the constitution and immediately split into parties. Um, but they didn't. Um, so the Federalists, when I write about the Federalists and the Jeffersonian Republicans, I tend to not call them the Federalist Party and the Republican Party because they aren't parties by by um, modern definitions. There isn't party discipline. There isn't party structure. There isn't any network that people sort of necessarily can connect to, or if there is, it's pretty haphazard. I call them political alliances and they morph all over the place so that, you know, depending on the issue, people who say they're one thing suddenly become another thing. You have people, you know, asking basic questions like, is Jefferson going to support Hamilton here? I mean, things that nowadays you just wouldn't assume in the case of parties. So what happened in the 1790s with Federalists versus Republicans, they did not see that as a two-party system. They did not see that as permanent parties. Each side for a long time denied that it was a party and claimed they represented the public, but the other side was a party. So you really, I don't think there was a first party system in the 1790s when you see how they understood what they were doing and how they were doing it. And when you see them struggling to do things that a party would do, right? My favorite example of this is, um, Thomas Jefferson in like 1799 trying to figure out how to distribute a pamphlet to people who agree with him and he can't figure out how to do it because it's not like there's a network it's not like there are um anything that he can rely on to get party information out um you know and he's sort of thinking are there like clubs are there ways how can we so um those are not parties those are as i said i call them political alliances uh, and the assumption after Jefferson becomes president, we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, is now that's done. That's a different, I think that's a different thing uh, than a, than parties or a party system. But it's a good, uh, it, it's a good question slash statement to make. I think that's, that's important. Dave's follow-up was, if we didn't have the Electoral College, would we, would it be more likely we'd have multiple parties? Oh. I, I don't officially know the answer to that. Uh, let me think about that for a sec. It might be. I I also think, and again, this is totally off the top of my head. Oh, here, and I see who is this Clinton, the tendency for such a winner takes all some single member district system to prone two-party organization, blah, 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 blah. I see. So people are, are talking about it. Um, I do think maybe part of what's distinctive about our political system is is federalism and is the num the amount of um the, the number of differences in the ways things happen on a state level versus a national level um and I, again i can't say how that does or doesn't absorb or encourage um diversity on a local level that can become two parties on a national level but it's a really really interesting question interesting Clinton put that in the chat Duverger's law because this year the um we the people which is a big national civics competition for high school students um one of the main questions that the judges threw at the kids was about Duverger's law and a couple of kids got kind of thrown off balance they weren't expecting that question so it's interesting that Clinton put that in there because that was kind of a spoiler this year for kids across the country um all right, so Dale, our good buddy from- Before we get to Dale, I do want to comment on um, Carol Lee. Federalist was a political alliance, not a party in the modern sense. The Whig Party was a party. By the time by the time you get to Andrew Jackson, you have organized parties with party discipline, with, you know, you, you have what we now consider to be a party. All of the things that go along with the trappings of a party, and then you have- Post after that point, parties as we would understand them. So, you know, I think by the time you get to Jacksonian Democrats, you've got you've got parties. But the Federalists and Republicans, um, I think when you call them a party, you assume that they can do all kinds of things that they couldn't do. Okay, I'm sorry. Back to Dale. Um, they're proposing a new political party. Lawrence Schmidt said, "Freedmanists." <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, that's a good one. All right, Dale asks. <laughs> When those dying parties passed away, was there any influence by the Supreme Court composition at the time? You're gonna. I'm sorry. You have to repeat that again. These are such 
diverse questions that my brain is going to like switch track. He was asking when when previous parties died in in the past, were there any influences by the Supreme Court composition at the time? Like leftovers from those dead now dead parties, but they're still on the court. So they still well, that certainly could happen. Yeah. I mean, yes. You know, I, I, I'm not gonna be able to say like, oh, yes, the justice so and so in 19 so and so. But, but yes, sure. You can have a, a, a Supreme Court justice who represents. I mean, you know, there were federalists on the Supreme Court after the federalists no longer really had national power. They were there. Right. Chief Justice John Marshall, for one. Um, so, yeah, you can have that kind of um, disjuncture uh, in the court versus the country, uh, to use a really old metaphor. Um, yeah, you could have that kind of holdover. All right, and La Lawrence clarified, he was talking about e economics with freedmanists, not a political party. But I kind of like the idea of Joanne starting her own political party. <laughs> no, I assume- so I think I assume if everybody in this me. chat joined it, we could run a candidate next time. Okay, <laughs> um, our good friend Miranda asks, who is our presidential candidate for the newbie party? That's an after party question, or could we form the newbie party if we don't want to be freedmanists? So we can save that one. I just want to put that in your ear. Well, we can, and again, for those of us who are here and are new, um, after the next 10 or 12 or 15 minutes, we will then segue to the after party when we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. So we could we could talk about the newbie party in the in the after party. Right. But, but Miranda's real question was, <laughs> How can we reconcile Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party today, especially as she lives right there in Springfield, Illinois? He was used quite well during Obama's first campaign as well for the Dems. So comparing like Republicans. Well, yeah. that's a big problem. You know, I mean, the, the party. Calling the current Republican Party the party of Lincoln is problematic, right? This 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 goes back to the earlier question about quoting the founders thing. We, we, you know, we are the party of the founders. The founders agreed with us. Um, you want to be the party of Lincoln because of who Lincoln is in American history and what he represents and the fact that he's maybe one of the few presidents before the 20th century, besides George Washington, that anybody knows <laughs> who existed. You know, I mean, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are sort of the ones that people know. Um, and th maybe Thomas Jefferson. But at any rate, um, you know, calling yourself the party of Lincoln in right now, the sort of extreme version, the MAGA version of the Republican Party, I think that's problematic. And that's my, what you might want to do to be able to sort of wave a Lincoln flag. Um, but again, as, as my comments today suggest, um, we need to rethink uh, and, and recategorize what we are seeing today um, as not the Republican Party, but as a Republican Party and maybe, you know, MAGA Republicans. So to make it clear that there's something different from the Republican Party that we have been assuming is in place because these folks, um, they've become, you know, and and I, I didn't include quotes, but when I was researching for this episode, there are a lot of Republicans saying whatever is here now, it's not the Republican Party anymore. Um, so when Republicans are telling you it's not the Republican Party, you know, um, it's not just anti-Trumpers, it's people who are saying, whatever this is, um, it's something new. Um, Kevin Brady says, Germany famously banned anti-democratic parties after World War II, and their democracy survives today. Should the U.S. consider doing the same? Banning? Banning any anti-democratic parties, parties that are trying to end, you know, democratic forms of government. Oh gosh, um, I I I hesitate on that one because banning a party uh, feels tricky and potentially open to abuse. Um, but I don't know the mechanics of how that was managed in Germany, so I can't tell you whether I think that's good. I just think um, banning a party in and of itself and defining it as anti-democratic it might it might be. Um, it might seem obvious, it might appear obvious, there might be ways to do it, but that makes me nervous, the idea of banning. Uh, yeah. And and our our own Jessica Ellison is saying that there's kind of a rise in far-right parties in Germany now, which I've been reading the same thing. The other thing that kind of scares me, and I can't put my hands on it now, but I'll put it in our Slack channel, 
There was a report that came out this past week, Joanne, looking at teenagers and kids under 25. And they were saying there's a huge gender split between girls and boys and boys are going more and more far right. And there's this Andrew Tate personality online that's very misogynistic and um, very MAGA. And a lot of young boys are tuning into his TikToks and things. And then they're saying girls are going more towards empathy and you know supporting Ukraine and that sort of thing. And so there's like this giant split happening. Um, and one of the points of the article was since women tend to live longer and there's more girls than boys in general, um, would that eventually tip the scale a little bit back towards the middle or towards not extremism? But it would take a couple of generations for that to happen. So just it, yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's not surprising that you get militancy and extremism and then extreme masculinity um all bundled together as we are right now. Yeah, no, I mean, who again, who knows? Uh, could that change things? Yeah, but is that gonna change things quickly? That I don't know, right? But it's a really interesting phenomenon. I also want to address um. Bobby says, if the MAGA extremists are such a small minority, I'm amazed they're such an influential force. Well, they're very united. They have someone at the head of them who's very loud and very aggressive. And um, I won't use other adjectives, but they have someone at the head of them who's just one big loudspeaker. Uh, and they are a minority, um, but they're very united, loud, united. Um, and not afraid of being extreme, not afraid of being violent, not af afraid of using threats. There are many reasons why MAGA folk, although they are a minority, um, are loud and influential. Um, but it's important. You know, I say this a lot, too, in a variety of different formats. Don't uh, mistake the loudness uh, for majority. They're not the same thing. Don't be fooled just because they act as though they represent the majority of us. Don't be fooled into believing that because they don't. Uh, but they sure want to make you think that. And, and that's important to bear in mind. Yeah, KT pointed out uh, the Roe decision brought a lot of girls out, young girls voting this past election cycle. You know, so maybe we're already starting to see a little bit of that. Um, Someone else in the chat said we could start the gynocratic party. <laughs> we could start the what? The gynocratic party. I don't. I don't think. I don't think that would get past school filters. It'd be hard for a school <laughs> so. teacher to, you know, if it's for gynocratic. You might get something you don't want your class to see. Anyway, um, Blake, our good buddy Blake. Before we get to Blake, I will. I will respond to Clinton who says a loud minority can overpower a silent majority. Yep. Don't be silent. Yeah. Speak up. Be loud, take up space. Uh, together, we can do a lot of things. Um, but I just wanted to put that in. Okay, back to Blake. Okay. And, and also, Linda asked, did I say dinocratic? No, we're not bringing dinosaurs back. Although some people in our Congress do resemble dinosaurs and they probably need to. I'm all for term limits. That's just my personal. Okay. Blake asks, when we're thinking about the death of the GOP, is it in a literal sense that the party will just cease to exist? Or more, uh, I'm going to mess up this pronunciation, ship of Theseus scenario, where it's slowly becoming a new party under the same name. I don't know. You know, I don't know if, um, I mean, right now they're so focused on cohering the base and making the loyalists sort of become, you know, one big blob of MAGA. Um that's what they're, they're kind of cohering as. Does that mean that they do that to the extent that then they just sort of tip over? Or does it really mean more that, you know, they sort of erode, which is more typical of how parties die? Is it people, they don't have as many supporters, people don't win elections, you know, th th it's more of an erosion process than a sort of tipping over and dying process. I don't know, because this isn't... Um, this is so extreme and so base focused. Uh, I don't know what the erosion or the defeat of that necessarily looks like. Um, I don't think anyone knows what that looks like. Uh, I think, you know, the Whig party died, the Federalist party died, but you could say, thinking about the Federalists and how they hang on on a state level for a while, they erode. Uh, and, and, you know, in the case of the Whig party, slavery ultimately couldn't avoid that. But again, people drifted into other parties and sort of drifted away it's a it's a more of a process 
um, then a you know presidential elections can make it seem like it, they were here and now they're gone because that's a dividing line. But normally it's a little bit more, it's murkier. Yeah. And somebody who's going under the name Zoom user, which always makes me hesitate a little, um, but they said, I seem to remember the death of the Democrats in 68, 88, <laughs> 98. So it seems like, you know, there's always the death of this party or that party. Well, right. So, so then death, keep coming back. It, it, you do have to then think about what death means, right? In a way, um, generally speaking, as a historian, right, you can declare a party dead when you look back and you can see that they no longer had candidates, they no longer held offices, they no longer, they vanished. We're in the moment. We're, we're looking forward in time and have no idea what's coming. I ask the question, is the Republican Party dying or dead? Because whatever's happening now, and I've seen in the chat, some people are saying, well, they're, they're metamorphosizing into something else. Um, or they're dying or whatever's going on now, there's a fundamental change going on now that you can see in the structures of what's going on in the question of the RNC and the question of people resigning um, in the nature of, you know, who's staying versus who's leaving, whatever's happening, something big is happening. And whether that means MAGA is the Republican party and you thereby say, well, the Republican party exists because it's MAGA or not, I don't know. Um, to me, um, because there are so many people who are more moderate and call themselves Republicans, but have nowhere to go, feels to me that whatever's happening now is not the Republican party because there basically still is a, a, a Republican mass of people who are drifting, but don't necessarily have place to go. And that's a really interesting kind of a vacuum opportunity and I don't know what will happen with that, but it's definitely worth watching. I think a lot of people are worried that some of them will go to Kennedy and there'll be just enough to siphon off there that it'll hurt Biden or possibly even Trump, but who knows? Who, who um, knows? Okay, so um, I think it's James Dennis, but he took all the vowels out of his name. He said it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like Jim's Dins. Uh, but I think it's James Dennis uh, says, is it correct that the Electoral College was originally conceived to defend against countries sending a bunch of people over here to the new nation to overwhelm its voting and take over? He says, Brookheiser often or once made this point and um, but didn't the U.S. turn around and kind of do that with Texas, Hawaii and other territories? And then <laughs> he also says, could the U.K. just join the U.S. as the 51st state? <laughs> And he already has a hashtag, hashtag more perfect UK. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, the Electoral College, um, and you know, um, somehow today is like my pointing out websites things uh, moment. The, the All of the um, Madison's notes from the federal convention, the constitutional convention are all online um, through the Library of Congress. Um, there's, a, there's a website, a, a century of lawmaking, uh, and that belongs to the Library of Congress that has, among other things, the record of what went on at the Constitutional um, Convention. And I forgot where I was going. What was I he heading towards about? About the, the electoral people college. coming over here to, to overtake us from yeah. the UK and we turn around kind of the same thing. No, like no, but the Electoral College was created and you can see this um, by looking at people like Hamilton who wanted electors to choose electors to choose the president. It was an anti-democratic gesture. It was a way of saying you don't have direct election of a president. You have people choose electors and electors choose the president. And because there was a lack of faith in what the masses would do, it was a way at the time, it was assumed that it was like instilling a, a, a safety layer into the process of electing a president. So that was the initial idea, which is why Hamilton, electors of electors of presidents, that's that's originally the reason. It was about distrust of the masses. It was about um, popular elections and the democratic small d component of the new government and how to allow it, but also how to channel it and and master it. Uh, and those impulses were going on at the same time. And you can see that, that that's where I started to go was a century of lawmaking under the Library of Congress. You can read um, the uh entire you know madison's notes and a few other people's notes as well mixed in and you can look up and see what they were debating about when they were debating the electoral college if you if you want to get your hands on the the primary materials yourself yeah 
Uh, all right, we've still got four open questions. I know we're after 11, so let's so try. Let's see. Okay, um, here's a good one. Zoom user again, but this this is a question that just, you know, for the teachers out there often get this, who counts as a founder? Oh, Ooh. okay, that's a question. Um, I've taken part in that debate. Um, I'll, I'll answer it very briefly since there are other questions and we're over time. Um, that's not an easily answered question and I think it's a little bit in flux. Um, I think people have started using Framer now to refer to a certain bunch of founders. So Framer meaning the people who actually frame the constitution in a way that's easier to bound in. Founder, you know, I mean, initially founder was a small group of very elite white men. Um, founder became actually not even founder. We used to say founding fathers, right? Which generally speaking, we do not say anymore because um, why do they all have to be fathers? Because there are people who acted, who were engaged in the, the sort of political trial and political debates and were part of what was going on, who we could call founders uh, and were not men. Um, so, you know, who is a founder? People argue like, is John Quincy Adams a founder? He's son of a founder. Uh, he kind of is active in the founding era, but he lasts kind of a lot longer. It becomes a line drawing exercise. Um, I think some people say it's generational. People who are engaged at a certain time and, and were in power in a certain generation count as founders. I don't think there's an easy answer to that. And it becomes highly politicized because there's a gender component to it, because there's a woke component to it that if you're saying it's not just eight elite white guys, <laughs> that then you're woke. Um, so there isn't an easy answer to that. I, I do not say founding father, I say founders and I define it broadly. All right, do we have time for one more? One more. Okay, Tim asks, uh, Tim Bosma, not Tim the Linkmeister, who was worried that you were cutting into his territory today, by the way, but he's Another still Tim. the Tim. Uh, the other Tim, Tim Bosma, says, what effect did the disappearance of a party have on subsequent presidential elections? So in the past, when parties died out, what effect did that have, especially with the Electoral College? Keeping that in mind. Well, I mean, what, what effect did it have? You know, you see in the mid-1850s, uh, right, the rise of the Republican Party, partly based on the fall of the Whig Party, and in that case, because there was a group of people, anti-slavery people, who came together and and defined that as their purpose in forming the Republican Party, some for moralistic purposes, slavery is immoral, some for practical purposes, they were focused on free labor in the West on the frontier. Either way, what you had was a, a boom of people who were sort of there and ready to form a party in the vacuum that was left by the, the collapse of the Whig Party. So that's part of what can happen. It was kind of what I was talking about before, right? There's, in a sense, there, there's a little bit of a vacuum now where we have Republicans, old school Republicans, non-MAGA Republicans, kind of floating around and not quite having a place to go. And the more extreme, blatantly extreme MAGA gets, the more that vacuum space is, is going to be apparent. What happens in that space is, is a really interesting thing to watch out for. All right. Well, Jessica wants to segue to the after party because we have a question from a fifth grader, which, you know, I'm always going to take oh, a question okay. from a fifth grader we, over one of y'all. Sorry. We are totally, rock. totally going to allow for that. Okay. So let me explain to folks what happens next. Okay. So um, what happens next is we will segue to the after party. What that means is that we will no longer be recording What's going on? What we just did here will be posted online and archived and you can go back and watch it or other people can find it as they wish at the same uh, place where you found this, unless you're on Facebook. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook to join the after party and you need to go to nchetech.org slash conversations. That's nchetech.org slash conversations. Uh, and that is the place where you will find all of the past 204 episodes. If you leave Facebook and go to that right now, then you, I see Linda is waiting for it. Oof, will be in the after party. Um, I always say poof. Again, for new people, there are things I always say. Contingency is one of those things. My poof uh, for the after party is another. Um, uh, before we poof and go to the after party, I do want to say um, a version of what I say every week. First of all, I want to thank you all 
for being here. Um, and for, first of all, thank Annie and thank Claire uh, and thank Jessica and thank NCHE and thank John for making this possible. Uh, and thank all of you uh, for being here and engaging in the conversation of democracy. Um, I say this every week with great passion. It's important. It's important that there are spaces we can go to to engage in conversation, to ask questions, to hash things out. And I did hear some, see someone say despair, fight despair. So last night, um, and I will relay this to you since you are my people, last night, um, given everything that was happening with the Supreme Court, uh, and many of us, including me, were feeling a sense of despair about what that might mean for the election. And I went and I recorded myself, and I will totally confess to you, I was wearing the t-shirt that I wear as pajamas. So basically sitting at 1137 at night in my pajamas, um, I just said to the world, don't despair, uh, because we're going to come together and we're going to act together. And that's some of what I want to say here. In addition to thank you for being here, thank you for engaging in the conversation of democracy, we will continue to engage in that conversation and we will be a we and we will foster democratic we's as best we can. And in and, and one way or another, this will probably come up uh, and we can talk about it, how to foster this sensibility. But I do want to make the point um, that allow yourself a little time to despair if you're feeling despair and then Put it over here and march forward. And as I said in my pajama comments, you know, survey the new political landscape and then figure out what the path ahead is. Um, okay. So, um, oh, look, so Jooms, uh, Jooms, you got to add the vowels back in there, Jooms. Um, Heather says times like these are, are what uh, reawaken democracy. Yes, right? You understand what's being threatened. You step forward, you step up, and you give voice to the things you believe in. And we're gonna be in that moment together uh, as these coming months come. Okay, uh, Democracy Awakening. So uh, I know we're running late here, but let's go to the after party so that a fifth grader asks a question and we can answer a fifth grade question. Um, everybody um, have, um, oh, there, see, June's didn't see, thank you. You gotta give us vowels, it's very hard. Um, Thank you all for coming and for being here. Have a really good week. Uh, who the heck knows what we're going to be talking about next week because we live in moments in a, at a time when every 35 seconds some radical thing is happening. But regardless, um, thank you all for being here and we will segue to the after party. <laughs>